Hello, everyone. Welcome to the post-election screening of Uptight uh, with the Leica Lens series organized by Yiddishkeit uh, here in Los Angeles and co-sponsored by the Los Angeles Review of Books. My name is Boris Drelouk. I'm the editor-in-chief of the LA Review of Books. And uh, it is my great pleasure um, to welcome uh, the panelists for today's discussion uh, to talk about Jules Dassin's uh, uh, remarkable film, Uptight. The first person I'll introduce is Robert Pecker, who is the director of Yiddishkeit. Uh, Robbie holds a PhD uh, in comparative literature from UC Berkeley, taught uh, Yiddish uh, literature and Jewish culture at the uh, University of Colorado Boulder, and is now the director of Yiddishkeit, about which he'll tell you in a moment. Um, and he will also explain to us uh, some of the rationale for picking this film as part of the series. But before we get to that, I'm going to introduce Jim Hoberman, who, as I always say, needs very little introduction, legendary film critic, cultural critic, um, staff writer for The Village Voice, and uh, his uh, author of a great number of books, uh, the la la latest of which is Make My Day, uh, Films of the Reagan Era. And our third panelist uh, for today is Mia Mask, um, professor of film at Vassar, uh, an author of Divas on Screen, um, as well as a co-editor of, um, uh, or uh, forgive me, editor of uh, a really remarkable anthology called Contemporary Black American Cinema. Um, and Right now, I'm going to uh, turn to Robbie so that he can tell us a little bit about uh, the film, uh, his selection, and also uh, why it, it makes such a, a good addition to our ongoing series. Sure. Well, I mean, I think the main thing that drew me to picking this film for, for this time was, of course, the events of the summer um, and the reaction across the country to the murder of George Floyd. Um, and then thinking about it cinematically and, of course, um, our own organization's relationship with the struggle against racism and uh, um, specifically the, the history of um, our organization's founders and the struggle for social justice in the United States. And then, of course, our series, which, um, you know, has quite a deep historical connection with figures uh, from the Jewish leftist past, um, people who were involved in the International Workers Order and the Artef Theater, um, including our for this film's director, Jules Dassin. Um, and of course, the larger artistic world of Yiddish speaking Jewish life that produced uh, artists, incredible artists like the cinematographer of this film, Boris Kaufman. Um, so that sort of got me thinking about, uh, about Uptight. Uh, and it's been a long time since I had seen it and I thought it'd be interesting to revisit it. Uh, it's not so frequently seen or talked about. So I thought it might be an interesting time to return to it. Absolutely. Um, so uh, now that we uh, have a, a good sense of why you chose the film, maybe I'll, what I'll do is I'll, I'll ask you a little bit about Jules Dassin and, and the direct connection to the roots of, of Yiddishkeit, as well as the, the, the Jewish background of, of this film. Sure. I mean, one of the interesting things about Jules Dassin, I think, is his relationship to uh, Jewish theater. Um, he got his start with the ARTEF, which is an acronym. And like all leftist organizations and Soviet organizations, uh, the culture loves its acronyms. Um, and ARTEF is uh, an acronym for the Arbeiter Theaterverband, uh, the, worker, the Workers' Theater League. And uh, this group was uh, organized towards the end of the 1920s by Yiddish speaking members that were associated with the Communist um, Young Workers League. And throughout its existence, the repertoire of the theater uh, company reflected its strong political engagement all the way up until its dissolution in 1940. Um, I would suggest for anyone who's interested more in the Artef itself, there's a, a really excellent book on the subject uh, by Edna Nachshon, which is called um, Proletarian, uh, Yiddish Proletarian Theater. Uh, which deals exclusively with the whole history, art, and politics of the of the Artef. Um, and Jules Dassin got his start there uh, uh, in in the Artef. And I and actually he I think actually his history of acting starts a little bit earlier uh, in Yiddish theater in particular. I think he had to actually learn Yiddish well in order to act in the Yiddish theater. His family was an English speaking family, insisted on speaking English in the home. He grew up in, uh, mostly in Harlem, uh, went to Morris High School in the Bronx, spoke English, and and. Uh, really pr brushed up his Yiddish to, to be in the Artef. Um, and uh, he, I think that his original uh, interest, his original entry into theater began at some of the left-wing summer camps. Um, he was uh, at a camp called Camp Nishkedaigit, uh, which means literally camp no worries or worry-free. 
uh, where he started acting. Uh, and, and later, too, um, his involvement with the ARTEF and with the International Workers Order brought him into other, uh, uh, into other Jewish uh, camping organizations and more general uh, workers in left-wing camps uh, where he worked and as an actor and teaching drama uh, as well. Very interesting. Um, and so uh, maybe what I'll do now is I'll uh, turn to Jim to give us a little bit more information on Dassin as a filmmaker and take us up to this moment in his career uh, when, when he sh uh, decides to shoot uptight. Uh, okay, uh, Dassin went to Hollywood in the 40s and he was a, um, a kind of up and coming young uh, filmmaker. Uh, his best known film from that period is, is The Naked City, which uh, was uh, one of the writers was Albert Maltz who was uh, later one of the Hollywood uh, uh, 10. Mm -hmm. um, he made several other really uh, um, tough kind of noirish films. I mean, not a particularly subtle director, but, but, but forceful. And, uh, and then he was, uh, he was named before the House on American Activities Committee. And so he, he self exiled. Uh, he, he made a movie in, in uh, England, um, Night in the City mm -hmm. uh, with Richard Widmark, which is uh, very highly regarded. Then he went on to France and it's, he made several movies there. And of course, you know, his name sounds like, I mean, Dessin. I mean, it sounds right. like he has a French and even name. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and he, he, the movie he made there was, um, uh, that made his reputation was Rafifi, which mm -hmm. really is, is still to this day, a kind of, uh, uh, you know, quintessential uh, heist film and he made a number of other international films. He uh, then um, fell in love with and married the Greek actress Melina Mercury, who was also quite political as, as was he. And he made um, uh, an enor another enormous international hit, um, Never on a Sunday, you know, sort of like the, uh, the quintessential happy hooker movie with a, a, a song that was, uh, you know, a, a, a top, the top 40 and became a standard of uh, of uh, weddings and bar mitzvahs and all sorts of uh, all sorts of things. Um, he was invited back to Hollywood in, in 1968, I guess, 67, 68, to make a, a remake of the um, uh, of the informer. And um, shall I go into that into, into that a bit? Let's or, just wait one second. Yeah. What I would like, uh, what I would like to do is, is turn back to Robbie for just one more um, uh, addition, which is throughout this period, um, uh, we've we've seen a number of films in the series that kind of intersect with some of the films and some of the some of the projects that Dassin worked on. Maybe you could say a, a bit more about that. Sure, and I think this relates to what Jim was talking about too, and just in terms of um, being a part of organizations that eventually le uh, lead him during the period of the blacklist to leave the United States. Um, you know, his experience with the ARTEF before he starts working in uh, in the movie industry brings him into touch with uh, a number of the other figures. Actually, I think that we've we've talked about uh, mentioned at least in some ex to some extent in our in our film series so far. Um, pr most most notably, I would say with his friend. Uh, uh, David Apatashu, who we uh, who we came across in the with who had the lead role in our film a couple films back, The Light Ahead, uh, who both starred in the Artef together um, and were part of the Artef during its most productive years during the years of the Popular Front, um, and uh, and both even starred in and, and in fact Dassin's first role, just by the way, is was in a. a play that's written by the poet Mesha Kulbach. Uh, and the dramaturg on that play was uh, was Haver Paver, who wrote the screenplay for The Light Ahead. So there's a lot of interconnections. And Napatashu also was, uh, in 1937, was in a production with das Dasin of, uh, of Schweik, The Good Soldier Schweik, um, which was also in direct dialogue with uh, the production at the Piscator Theater, which I think links us back to our previous film, uh, Kameradschaft. Uh, so there's a lot of interconnections. Um, and of course, the whole scene of people who were involved with the International Workers Order um, and, and doing work uh, to promote uh, specifically anti-racism, which was the, the central doctrine at, at, during this period uh, of, of, the, of the left uh, left wing movements like the IWO, um, 
was really profound. I mean, just the way that they intersected with all these different uh, political uh, and artistic figures. Um, and oh, I should also mention that Zero Mostel and uh, who was in our film, uh, Panic in, Panic the, in the Street, we saw a while ago, um, also worked alongside uh, Dassin at the cam at uh, the IWO's Camp Kinderland. Uh, doing drama, being in their drama studio. So there's a number of interconnections between these uh, leftist, uh, politically active uh, figures from the theater who end up in in the movies that we've actually seen up until now. So a lot of kind of interconnections all along the way um, as they enter into this kind of politically engaged uh, cinema that we we see with Dassin in particular. Kamaradshaft, indeed. Um, so what, what I'll do now is maybe, um, Robbie, I'll let you go for, for a little while. Sure. Uh, and then uh, later, when, when it comes time to answer questions from the audience, we'll bring you on if, the, if, the, if perhaps your expertise Sounds good. will help. Thank you. Um, so Jim, uh, now that we've learned a little bit more about the political background of Dassin himself, maybe you can tell us uh, a bit about the political background of this film, um, uh, its inspiration and, and how it how it interacts with both what Dassin experienced in Hollywood uh, before then and and the political moment of 1968-69. Yeah, I'll mention a couple of things uh, briefly as I can, and then maybe we'll come back to them uh, later. I mean, uh, the uh, thing about up, uptight, or one of the things that's so fascinating about it is that it's it's a it's a deeply read film. I mean, uh, it's full of, uh, of, uh, of former communists. So, you know, everywhere from the, from the, from the titles by the Hubleys uh, to Dassin to uh, uh, several of the cast members and, and co-creators. And it's also, at the same time, I would, I would think the most militantly black film that was made in, uh, in, in, in Hollywood in, 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 during the 60s. Um, and the fact that it had a white director, you know, is something then that that is kind of played out uh, in a subtext uh, is, a, is a subtext and not even a particularly subtle one in the in the movie. But it's important to to um, uh, emphasize that um, both uh, Julian Mayfield and and uh, Ruby D are are co creators of this mm -hmm. of this movie. And uh, you know, Julian Mayfield was was a a an extremely um, versatile and talented guy. I mean, he started, you know, as a as an actor. He had published uh, several novels. He also was a, was an activist, and and Ruby D was was not just an actor, but she was an activist as well. And they were they were part of a kind of loose group, um, you know, based in Harlem, of uh, uh, creative people who were uh, sort of associated. With Paul Robeson, to take another person who I think figures in, you know, the uh, uh, Yiddishkeit's uh, uh, programming, and uh, this not only included uh, Mayfield and Ruby D, but also Asi Davis, uh, also uh, Harry Belafonte, also John O'Killens. I mean, there's there's a whole group of intellectuals who are who are um, also Lorraine are kind of, Hansberry. Yeah, yeah, Lorraine, of course, very important, Lorraine Hansberry. Yeah, I mean some. Who are, are um, communists? Some who are just close, you know, who are just leftists, you know, like Harry Belafonte and so on. <clears throat> so Mayfield brings a lot mm -hmm. to this uh, to this movie because I think what happened was that Paramount, you know, this is like the 1968. It's the year of Bonnie and Clyde. So the studios are trying to figure out what what can they what are they going to do? I mean, they they, they you know something is happening, but they don't know what it is. So so Bonnie and Clyde is a 30s film. The, the informer, the, the John Ford version of this. And I should say that the novel also, Liam O'Flaherty was another communist. Right. And in the 30s, you know, like the, the leftists loved, you know, the Ford movie. He was considered a leftist too. So there's that whole thing. But um, uh, I think that, that, that Paramount figured also we'll do a remake of the informer, you know, and, the, and you know, the kids will like it, you know, I don't know, they, you know, they, but it's also a 30s thing. And it was Dassin who dis, who wanted to, and they were gonna bring Dassin back, you know, to, to they invited him back to make this film. So it was Dassin's idea to, to set the film in Harlem. Mm -hmm. But I think that once he started working on it, he realized, I mean, he's, he's been away from the United States for, uh, uh, for nearly 20 years. And this is, so he, 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 he couldn't write this script 
himself. I mean, he needed he needed help, and he, I guess he got in touch with, uh, uh, with 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 Mayfield, who was quite a militant guy at that point. I mean, Mayfield had moved on from the uh, uh, from the from the Communist Party to become a kind of um, uh, internationalist. I mean, a uh, you know Pan African leftist. He lived in Ghana for a while. Then he came back and he uh, uh, he was involved in, in Cuba. And most controversially, he was he was a de defender of um, uh, Robert Williams, who was uh, the, the guy you know advocate you know self defense, picking up the gun against the Klan, and who had to eventually go to Cuba and so on. So he was he was way <laughs> past what uh, Adasson's politics would have been. So my, it's, my guess is that he had a lot to do with, with forming the essential conflict in the film between, yeah. you know, the, uh, um, uh, <clears throat> the, 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 the moderates, you know, the civil rights, you know, nonviolent uh, uh, group, you know, the, the more militant black power group, also old left, new left, all, all these things, yes. uh, things yeah. are in there. And, uh, um, you know, so so that that's that's a component of the of the of the film as well. And how these guys got along, I'm not sure. I don't yes. think that anybody was talking to each other after the film came out, especially when it turned out to be such a such a fiasco. This is another thing which we can get to later. Yes, yes. How audiences responded to this to this movie. Absolutely. But before we get to the to the response, um, I'll ask Mia to maybe position this film in the history of, of black cinema uh, sure, and tell us sure. where it stands. Yeah. But if I could also jump in and, and create a little bit of connective tissue between some of the things Jim said, because I agree with with so many of them. I just kind of want to go back to Paul Robeson for a minute and say, mm -hmm. absolutely, like it's a great point to begin with Robeson for many reasons, because he was a kind of mentor figure for all of the younger people we've mentioned, for whether it was Lorraine Hansberry um, or Poitier and Belafonte, uh, Ruby D and Ozzy Davis. And, you know, obviously we know he had been to Russia himself and he had met with the great uh, Russian filmmaker, Sergei Eisenstein, and was very impressed with, uh, and thought, um, not just, uh, not necessarily just with Eisenstein, but with possibilities of communism for bringing, uh, for uh, creating racial equality or for at least creating opportunity for, for black Americans where he saw none here. And I just wanted to say that that one of the, uh, so he created a kind of a, a community that in which these artists, Ruby D among them, uh, came up with uh, a sense of sympathy for an empathy and identification with their, their communist brethren. Uh, and uh, I wouldn't say go so far as to say she was necessarily a card carrier, but uh, was certainly in that milieu. Mm -hmm. And also, Jim, I just want to point out that I think one of the reasons the production was moved from Harlem to Cleveland is it's sort of reported that there were there were difficulties trying to get the you know to to uh, film there that the NYPD were going to give them difficulties and they had a predominantly white crew they couldn't get any um, African Americans for the crew and so this also created some tension uh, on on set both uh, for, for the for the issues that that they were going to face on set uh, even when once they got to Cleveland so there were racial Racial tensions really from the beginning of of the production, but then well, I also want. Sorry, well, I just wanted to just parenthetically say that Cleveland. It's, it's interesting that they went to Cleveland because Cleveland had just elected a black mayor, mm -hmm. and I, it was probably the first large city in America to have a black mayor, and that created a situation where they would be much more sympathetic to the to the production. Same thing happened with the speak with the spook with the spook who sat by the door. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, yeah. Later on, I'm sorry. So that's no, 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 no that, yeah. that, that's absolutely right. And um, I just want to say that so those uh, sort of uh, Russian undercurrents are there, even from you know some from Paul Robeson on down, and that that Mayfield. You're absolutely right when you say he is someone who had uh, worked for Nkrumah uh, and done and mentored uh, the uh, expatriate uh, black artists, uh, African American artists in Ghana. 
and uh, then came back to the U.S. and taught at NYU for a while, mm -hmm. uh, you know, before uh, getting into filmmaking. So definitely very left, definitely radicalized, had been with Amiri Baraka to Cuba, as you said. And so this was the, the uh, environment in which he would be partnering to write the script. And, and Dassin asked Ozzy Davis to also sign on as scriptwriter, but uh, he was busy with other projects. And so Davis suggests Ruby D. And that's one of the ways she becomes involved in the project and is intimately involved in the writing and rewriting the retitling of the film from Betrayal to Uptight, because they felt that number one, Uptight better uh, you know, uh, it was, is, was more within uh, a colloquialism that African Americans could identify with and spoke a little bit more to black vernacular um, uh, idioms. And so they began rewriting and retooling to make the character, to breathe a certain kind of authenticity into the script. And there were many decisions to, uh, to come to your question, Boris, that they were negotiating with Dassin uh, to try and make the film, uh, you know, blacker, right? Or, and, yeah. and more authentically African-American in some ways. And so there were a number of things that, um, that they did, but, they, but the production still struggled, even in Cleveland, because when they get there and they start shooting, um, maybe because it, maybe it was a union issue, or because there are no blacks in the union, they had no blacks on the crew. Mm -hmm. And you began to have folks walking off of the uh, uh, crew members walking off of the film, saying that it challenged their uh, their love for their country because there were parts of the script that seemed too sympathetic to the black radical uh, elements and seemed to suggest that it was acceptable to riot, to shoot watch, to shoot uh, night watchmen, and that it would encourage Negro hoodlums to to uh, to commit violence. So it was a, a, a production that was fraught in some ways, even from the beginning um, in terms of crew participation. Yet um, Ruby D and Dessen had, uh, excuse me, and uh, Mayfield, uh, Julian Mayfield had, had worked with Dassin throughout to make the script, to bring the script to a place where they thought it would uh, reflect, uh, number one, this, the tension uh, around the Teddy character, that Teddy was somebody who uh, Mayfield felt wouldn't, it would not be realistic to have him be intimately involved with this, this uh, more radical um, black power group and that they would have to expel or, you know, yeah. expel him from their uh, inner circle. And Mia, uh, before, before we go on, I would love to show that clip because sure. you have that Teddy clip queued up so we can discuss it after, after we see it. Um, Absolutely. Let's, let's, let's roll the clip. I've always wanted to say that. <laughs> the times, man, the times. Things have changed. I haven't changed. I have every right to be here. Man, oh man, when Whitey talks about his right. You get off that Whitey crap! I'm no conscience-stricken liberal. For wasting time. Selma, lunch counters, Birmingham. Yesterday. A phase we went through together. Now we don't walk together anymore. It's policy now. No whites. That's great. Stomped on. Spilled blood. But you can't work here anymore. Disqualified. Wrong complexion. Don't shout, friend. We got to do it alone. You can't do it alone. Without me, you can't win. Without me, you're gonna get killed. If you'll excuse us now, Teddy, Kai wants to talk to us. What I love about that is the variety of reactions uh, and the variety of tones that these people take with, with Teddy. 
Um, uh, maybe Mia, you can reflect a little bit on that, and if Jim, if you have something to add about how this actually, uh, how this is very much obviously a Mayfield and and uh, Ruby D contribution, yeah. And how it reflects the discussion in the country at that time. Yeah, thanks, Boris, for for um, you know picking up with this clip because I think it's one of the most powerful scenes in the film, uh, particularly in terms of its representation of Black characters and the complexity and range and depth that it gives the Black characters. I mean, we know that so much of, of American cinema has stereotyped Black people, right? And they're usually monolithic. I mean, this has been the history of Hollywood cinema, that they're usually these monolithic one or one dimensional figures. And what I love about this film is the, as you just said, the sort of range of responses, you know, to him. There are people who are angry there. And then there are people who are just really calm, like, you know, mm -hmm. it's, relax, brother, like, you just can't be with us, you know. And so there are these really nice nuanced moments that I speak that I think speak to these the strength of the Dassin D Mayfield collaboration to bring to fruition a a more a richer and more complex tapestry a representation of of black artists yeah absolutely black uh, yeah. absolutely and and jim if, if you can add something to that my no, next question uh, <laughs> i was going to say that this is one of the ways in which it really differs from the from the john ford film i mean uh, uh where you know the, the the characters are much are much simpler and 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 less less expressive and what to me what it what it's a it anticipates uh, do the right thing, mm -hmm. which is a movie where you have, you know, like a lot of different points of view, you know, expressed throughout and is, is really, you know, like a, 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 a quite a, a powerful conversation going on. I mean, I think that there's more of that in, in, um, in, in, in do the right thing, but I think that, that, you know, in, in discussing the, uh, the differences also among the, uh, uh, the black characters too. Are are constantly like like negotiating different uh, different strategies, and and then the other thing that I'll add that's so <clears throat> compelling is the degree to which they make Tank a representative of the old left. I mean, he was mm. a union organizer. He got laid off. He's an industrial worker. I mean, it's he really is you know is is something other than uh, uh, BG and that form of nationalism. And what he's watching at the start of the film, the 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 king, the uh, the fallout from yeah. the king's death is very yeah. much his own funeral. Um, you know, it's a, it's, yeah. It's, it's, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, uh, that is exactly, you've anticipated my next question, um, which is uh, to Mia, could, could you, uh, you, you said so beautifully how this d demonstrates nuance um, uh, in a way that other representations of, of blacks on screen had not up until that point. How long would it be until more such depictions would emerge out of Hollywood? Uh, it's, it's really remarkable to see this now uh, because even now we are, I, I think, shocked by the, by the, the nuance. Absolutely. Oh, and this is such a great point because you make me think of, um, contemporary films, uh, which some of which I really, you know, have enjoyed and I think are quite brilliant films, but they often will have or present the, you know, the great white hope character, you know, that is somehow integral to saving the black community. And, you know, I, I joke that in the nineties, it was the great white Kevin Costner, you know, <laughs> whether it was in Dances with Wolves or Bodyguard, you know, Kevin Costner was there to do right, you know, and, and show you that it was all going to be okay. Right. And so um, but this film doesn't have that that mm -hmm. character. And I think that's partially a function, once again, of this collaboration between Dassin and Mayfield and D to to massage the script in particular ways. And I think you were trying to also get me earlier to talk a little bit about the history of African-American cinema right up until this point. So from 1950, as you all know, to 1967, we have literally that sort of that whole long period period, uh, 17 years of Poitiers, right? Of po this sort of ascent of Sidney Poitier. And I'm an avid student of his career and a fan of, of his work. And, um, you know, but he really struggled, as we all know, to, uh, to be 
placed within black community, to have black family. He was always in isolation and he was uh, often criticized for being too assimilationist in terms of his screen persona. So by the time you get to the 67 trilogy of To Serve With Love in the Heat of the Night and Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, you know, it's, it's, it's been so long that, so, you know, it's been 17 years of a black masculinity that's been kept in check by the Hayes Code, by mainstream film goer expectations. And so you don't have yet. We haven't had until like the mid 60s, you know, the beginning with the with the uh, all you know, the black Westerns. Right. You begin to have a black masculinity growing and pushing out beyond, you know, the, the boundaries. And that's also a function of Hollywood, as Jim has already said, um, t trying to take a note from other other cinemas, European modernism and loosening up and the Hays Code relaxing, so forth. So you begin to have a, a, a movement away mm -hmm. from the conventional masculinity that Poitier represented, a kind of uh, uh, over assimilationist and, and somewhat placating um, you know, ultra urbane, ultra uh, um, sort of uh, middle class uh, masculinity that was also very desexualized, right? Yes. Uh, and intentionally, uh, and then along comes you know Jim Brown uh, and and Fred Williamson and and Richard Roundtree, and that all begins to you know to unravel. Um, but it it just starts in those in those late you know in nineteen sixty six and sixty seven and sixty eight. Uh, so that's part of this context as well. Well, that's um, again connects to what I was going to ask next, which is um, how does the situation that that we see reflected in this film, um, the the tension that we see reflected in this film, how does that connect to our current moment? And what do you what lessons do you think we can draw from some of the hard conversations that this film raises? Um, for what we're yeah. going now, I'm going yeah, now. sure. Well, I think that um, there's a lot we can learn from this film, um, and it it parallels this moment uh, in a way that's quite unsettling, quite disturbing when we see how far we haven't come, right? Uh, in terms of when you think about the Harlem riot of 1964 or the Watts riots, those riots actually began because the police had, had enacted some violence on either a motorist that got stopped and then a pregnant woman was injured, as in the case of the Watts riot, or a 15-year-old being, uh, being uh, shot by an off-duty white officer in the Harlem riot of 1964. And when you think about the similarities to the to the Black Lives Matter movement today, which is precipitated by police brutality uh, uh, and police killings of innocent people, it's it's quite you know it sh it, sh it sh makes you shudder. It's quite That's distressing. Right. And so what the the page that you know what we can learn from this is that um, we see how far we haven't come in some ways and that the cinema is still trying to reckon with this. But were you wanting me to go in a different direction? No, 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 that's exactly the right direction. And, and especially um, for, for me, one thing that struck me was uh, the brave depiction, as you were saying, of black masculinity as, as kind of unapologetic and absolutely um, self-confident. Uh, and that is, I think, something uh, that we're struggling with uh, now too, we you know we, we, when we think about these acts of violence uh, perpetrated by the police, so often the 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 blaming of the victim has to do with kind of hypermasculine or. So I, I I was hoping that you would speak a little bit about that. Yes, uh, you absolutely see that uh, in all of these cases. But what's so uh, distressing about your point, Boris, is that even in, I mean, when you look at a Tamir Rice mm -hmm. or a Trayvon Martin, these are not hyper-masculine figures. These are boys. Exactly. You know, so you really, you just are so thrown and so distressed by the fact that you're absolutely right. At, at the, the violence against black bodies, against black men in particular, seems to have been precipitated by the idea of the brutal black buck, right? From from birth of a nation on down and from you know the history of slavery on down. But in point of fact, some of this violence, you know, has been perpetrated against 15 year old boys, or we think of Emmett Hill. I mean, you know, it's it's a state sanctioned violence against black and brown bodies, many of which are male. 
and and the way that this film attacks that that notion that that you know that no matter how urbane no matter how tame no matter how uh, civilized no matter how everything that they you know that that people want you to be you are you are still subject to violence and and it's it's a really it's a really remarkable uh, thing to to behold uh, as you say how how <clears throat> we haven't come that far, Jim. Have no, time. I just wanted to add a, a, something about how the how the police are represented here. I mean, they they are clearly an occupying army, and this is something that I think you know can can be you know there 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 there's 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 a, a um, precedent for this in in the uh, the novel the informer and the uh, and 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 the movie too where where there's this in, in in that case there's this kind of there's there's this internecine warfare going on among the uh, the Irish revolutionaries but it's going on and they, they're being occupied they're 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 the black and tans are 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 always there and uh, um, here it's even a more drastic occupation and the scene in which uh, Johnny is is uh, uh, cornered and shot is quite amazing I mean maybe we'll look at you know uh, I know that Mia brought some stills yeah. from that but yeah. you know the idea that it becomes it's a kind of spectacle for this for this neighborhood I, th I think that probably the filmmakers might even have been thinking of a battle of Algiers also when they ah, had you know the, uh, the the cops come into this this neighborhood where they 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 shoot um, Johnny down, and then they're pelted with garbage. Yeah, you know yeah. they sort of have to retreat. They they're able to, you know, they 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 have the guns, but in the end they're 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 kind of driven out of this this neighborhood. I mean, it's a very different view of what you know, like a riot uh, uh, would have uh, uh, would have been. It's 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 shown as a kind of invasion. Yeah. And, I uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I, mean, yeah I, I completely agree. And and thank you, Jim, so much for going there because I, I brought that a couple of stills also from Sergi Eisenstein's Strike in 1925, obviously silent film, because it calls to mind the blocking and staging mm -hmm. of this riot where Johnny is killed, as, as you say, uh, because what's happening in Strike is the workers are being chased by um, the strike breakers who are on horseback and have come with weapons and are lit have literally chased them back uh, like, you know, like dogs mm -hmm. back to the tenement, back to the apartments where they live. And they, the, the people go and, and hide in the, in the balconies and the police ride their horses up into the balconies and, and massacre the people. So it's a massacre like the scene uh, we, where Johnny is murdered. And I think that it's intentional that uh, Dassin is, has, has, has blocked the scenes in this way. And, and Jim, you said you, you know that he actually constructed this set, correct? Yes, that's right. It's, it was shot, that, that part of the movie was actually shot in Hollywood on the Paramount lot. Yeah, which was part of the film that they, you know, they had to to leave shooting in Cleveland after having so much difficulty yeah. on set and and shoot the rest of the film on sound stages at and Paramount's uh, studio a lot. And so uh, this was some of the uh, scenery that they constructed. So I think it's intentional. He's calling our our attention to, as you say, a kind of army, a, a, a militaristic presence, and a pursuit, a kind of violent pursuit, like what we. We would see in the Battle of Algiers uh, between the occupying force and the mm -hmm. oppressed. And it's interesting because, of course, by quoting uh, Eisenstein, he is either consciously or subconsciously uh, expressing allyship, uh, uh, a leftist allyship, um, with with the experience of, of blacks in, in the 1960s. So it's a it's a it's an interesting move on his part to kind of wed. You know, he he's like Teddy once again. He's trying to get back in in the scene and. Um, yeah, uh, Jim, did you have some thoughts on that? No, no, I think that that's true. I think that Dassin is trying to find is 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 looking for his own place in this film, and it's an awkward it's an awkward situation because he is the director. I mean, it's his project. He has a he has an all white crew, and he's he, uh, you know, the, the 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 scene with Teddy makes it clear that he's he's absolutely aware of that, mm -hmm. and he's trying to figure out, you know. Uh, um, what that what that could mean? Um, 
I think that the fact that there was a kind of internationalist quality, certainly to the um, uh, the thinking of, uh, of of Mayfield, although it was different than he, different internationalism than it would have been when he was a communist, probably, but also Ruby D. I mean, Ruby D. And Ossie Davis were were very involved in in uh, um, you know I, I, protesting the execution of the Rosenbergs. I mean, they yep. were involved with. Uh, uh, people who had been blacklisted. I mean, she's in the original production of the World of Shalom Aleichem, which was, yeah. which was completely. St- I mean, that that was a, that was a that was a very red. You know, it, it, you know that that was a very red production. I mean, everybody involved in that had been blacklisted, and that's why Zero Must. I think that's a there's a there's a connection between Ruby D and Zero Mustel since they're both in that. But yeah, yeah. that's um, why I, I wanted to begin with Robeson, because I feel like so much of the yeah. tutelage, so much of the tutelage and mentoring of those uh, artists who come of age in the 50s and 60s, like Ruby D and Belafonte and Poitier and Hansberry, is informed by Paul Robeson's thinking, his cosmopolitanism and his sort of move beyond the, the U.S. That's right. Yeah. Uh, in about um, 10 minutes, I'm going to try to open this up to, to questions. So if you have any questions, if you're watching this now, please do uh, leave them in the, in the comments and we'll, we'll uh, raise them to the screen when we start responding. Um, but I, I wanted to ask Mia a little bit about uh, Ruby D because we haven't, we've mentioned her name several times, but if you can give us just a little bit of background for those who don't know, uh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So Ruby D um, was somebody who, as a youngster, really as a teenager, was interested in in theater and um, auditioned for the Amer- American Negro Theater. And her parents allowed her to go to ANT, um, and that's where she met Harry Belafonte as a young woman. She actually was married before she married Ozzie Davis to a um, a man named Frankie D Brown, which is where she got her her name last name D but she insisted that he drop Brown because she didn't want to be Mrs. Brown. And so she becomes Ruby D. Um, and she got her first job on Broadway in South Pacific. Um, she ultimately will divorce him in 1945. And then um, soon after she a- appears in uh, a stage production of Jeb, star- which also stars uh, Ozzie Davis. And it uh, is a play in which she's cast as his girlfriend friend. And this is where they begin to work together uh, for the first time. And, it, you know, when she dis- discusses the, you know, getting to know him, it wasn't as though it was love at first sight, but it was a relationship that she explains really kind of grew over time. And uh, then they, then it kind of hit them both, I think. And uh, she will be, she will appear in Anna Lucasta in 1948. She goes to New Jersey and they're married, uh, Ruby D and Ozzy Day. Davis. And as Jim said, you know, she was somebody who was very political throughout her career. Her art was political. Her art, her activism, and her life were all sort of intertwined with these values uh, of the how the arts needs to be committed. And she, I, she, there's a wonderful quote where she says, "Art is supposed to serve the people." just like the constitution. Mm. And I think like, wow, that's, you know, that kind of says it all and says a lot about her commitment to the arts as a form of social uh, activism. Mm -hmm. So um, that's 1948. By 1950, she is appearing in the film No Way Out, which was was also Sidney Poitier's screen debut. It's the film in which he plays Dr. Richard Brooks assigned to uh, treat a white patient who is quite bigoted and she has a small role as uh, as the wife of Ozzie Davis who mm-hmm. also has a smaller role in that film um she is somebody who the who J. Edgar Hoover had files on, right? I mean, you know, so so throughout the 50s, I should say, though, she'll make the Jackie Robinson story, St. Louis Blues. She would, in 1959, appear in uh, Take a Giant Step, which was a, a film that was also a predominantly Black cast uh, uh, film and that was about a Black family, very parallel in some ways to a raisin in the sun in that film she plays the um 
domestic, uh, you know, the housekeeper for a middle class black family. And it's a coming of age story about their son, played by um, Johnny Nash, actually, who is struggling with racism in his school, in his high school, and in particular with the curriculum that uh, his, t his teachers, the history teacher, ha is presenting that he feels is whitewashed. And so nice. it's also a, a really interesting production. So throughout the 50s, um, she's, you know, making a number of these very progressive films. And if you look at her career from No Way Out to Do the Right Thing, you know, I do hope we talk more about Do the Right Thing, Jim. Yes. Um, uh, you see that that there is, uh, or, or you look at a film like Black Girl, that there, she's made a commitment over the entirety of her career to choose roles that are deeply progressive and deeply committed to social justice issues. Now, she would be actively involved in the writing and rewriting of the Laurie character uh -huh. within this film, right, within uh, Dasson's Uptight. And I think that she helped evolve that character as well. Now, that's, that's a great uh, point uh, that you make, uh, her involvement in the script, because I, I really would like to talk about the ending of the film. And to do that, I think I'll bring Robbie back. Uh, uh, maybe he can contribute some insights, too. So, uh, Robbie, when, when you and I were discussing the film, you had mentioned that the the ending was a uh, was reversed. Yes. Uh, oh, you're you're muted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, from what I've read, I, that when Jules Dassin did the initial pass on the on the tr transformation of the Informer screenplay, he had uh, one ending, and that Julia Mayfield and Ruby D had changed the ending significantly to lead to Tank uh, committing suicide at the end. Um, and in an interesting uh, twist of how the final hand of the filmmaker gets shown in this film, he reverted it back to uh, having the two uh, rad black radical nationalist figures uh, actually firing the, the, the shot in a moment of kind of ambivalence, right? Because one doesn't want to shoot him, the other shoots him. Uh, and so it's a, it's a very interesting change in the way that the the script happens and i i'm it's very I, i'm not exactly sure what to make of it it's yeah. it's uh it's challenging i think to think about it yeah yeah <laughs> yeah can i just say i know i'm raising my hand it's like i'm in class with my you know <laughs> oh this is the best this is the best class i've ever taken oh it's so sweet but um you uh, you all probably know that ruby d and mayfield but d in, uh, in particular really felt that they did not want to see, I'm sorry, um, yeah, Mayfield indeed did not want to see the tank character killed by other black people. That, you know, that was what they, what she was, you know, sort of most upset about. They wanted it to be a suicide, but Dasson, he, he didn't want it that way, yeah. 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 Well, it, in a way, I mean, I, I, it, this is, uh, it, it is a suicide in the sense that people sometimes, you know, like refer to, to like, Suicide by police. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's in. He invites them to uh, 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 to shoot him, and you know, there's the one who who won't, and yes. and 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 the other one who's much angrier who will. So I think that that I understand what you know the objection would be, but I think that it's um, you know that 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 there is a, a suicidal aspect. To it as well, and then of course, Danson gets to do this thing that he loves to do. It's the end of uh, uh, that's right, the, the, the Naked City, where the guy just goes tumbling all the way exactly. down, and it right. mirrors, you know, Johnny's shot being shot by the uh, uh, by by the police. So um, that's that, that's that's only that's my my uh, my observation about it. I mean, um, you know, he I would say that he might also have felt that this was um, uh, truer to the uh, um, to the theme of the of the of the novel mm -hmm. where that's 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 what happens i mean that that you know and informing is the, is a cardinal sin as you know bg you know like says again and again bg's a very interesting character himself i mean we mm -hmm. should mention that that you know the casting in this is is phenomenal. I mean, Roscoe Lee Brown is in it, and and uh, uh, Raymond St. Jack, and and evidently, Juanita Moore, and we need a hall. Did you see? Yeah, Juanita Moore. Uh, Juanita Moore. Yeah, as and, the mother. Yeah. yeah, 
Yeah. And um, uh, evidently, uh, Dasson originally wanted uh, um, uh, uh, Great White Hope. Um, oh, um, you know, the bad guy in Star uh, Wars. Oh. No, no, uh, uh, James. Oh, James Earl Jones. James, James yes, he, that's James right. James Earl Jones. He, yes, J yes, he wanted him, and and uh, he couldn't get him, and that's when Mayfield, who had an experience, was an experienced actor, you mm -hmm. know, uh, uh, came in. So um, I just wanted to get back to you know, but the, the, the BG, you know, is there's a class thing going on there too, which is you know, he's a he's a junior high school teacher. He's yeah. like a very different, you know, uh, uh, very, very, very different than 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 Tank, and um, uh, can be so cold, you know. It's like, I mean, this is also, you know, like a way of, you know, like as a cr criticism of the communists that he could be, you know, so uh, um, unemotional. Yeah, or I you know, it, I think it's part of the complexity of the of the of, of the movie, and uh, so yeah, I. I and you know, I was just saying in that same in yeah. that same scene with Corbin, uh, the Corbin character, who's the younger uh, re rev revolutionary character, vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, BG. It's a very interesting. Both of them have this uh, a real uh, coolness about them, uh, where they're just like, "Hey, you're not welcome to Teddy in that scene." Where yeah. they're both like, "You're not. You're simply not welcome here." Yeah. And the older figure, uh, the Kyle, Kyle is is trying mm -hmm. to advocate on his behalf. Yeah. Uh, to no avail. And it's this interesting kind of, absolutely this kind of the coldness, the kind of, uh, of those characters, it well, really is striking, I think. Um, well, but even there is a difference passion. because Corbin says you have to go, you know, like, uh, educate the white brother. I mean, he's, he's actually being very kind in his, okay. in his way. Yeah. And, and, and BG says, yeah, you can get us guns. Yeah. That's what, you know, I mean, he's. Yeah. yeah. And there are some great moments when he says, you know, you can educate the white brother. And some, some people would say, you know, that's relevant today. You know, when white people say, yeah. what can we do about Black yeah. Lives Matter? Well, white people yeah. can educate other white people. So that yeah. has uh, some relevance to today as well. Also, I wanted to point out that I think that there other nuances and complexities are things that Dassin insisted on, whereas the representation of black homosexuality, which is more nuanced here. I mean, it's not nuanced. It's very stereotypical. Yeah. But that that um, that Mayfield and maybe even D wanted the partner, the boyfriend to Roscoe Lee Brown to be white, you know, the uh, at, because they felt that the gay scene was more integrated. Um, and Dasson, and, you know, kept that that lover boyfriend as a, uh, a black actor. I thought that was significant mm -hmm. because it doesn't sort of imply that in, that homosexuality. I mean, you know, at least you're seeing a, a gay couple as opposed to the idea that homosexuality is really not part of the black community. Right. The sort of stereotypical mm -hmm. uh, idea. So there were other things that he insisted on that I think, as you're saying, make the film quite nuanced and complicated. Absolutely. Um, and I think what we can do now is talk a little bit about the reception of the film in its time uh, and then move on to a question from the uh, from the audience about uh, uh, one key element of. Well, of just I'll give you a, a very brief. <laughs> the, uh, you know, they, they, <clears throat> Paramount really did not know how to market this movie at all. And uh, one of the more bizarre things is that they had a screening uh, a kind of preview in New York in which they invited uh, uh, H. Rap Brown to mm. talk about to talk about the movie. And I mean, he was probably Hoover's public enemy number one <laughs> at, at, at that time. But he, he he defended the movie. He didn't think it went far enough. But the but the, the screening was disrupted by the members of Newsreel, this uh. Uh, this new left group who had their own documentary on the Black Panthers. And they just like projected it in the middle. They, they sort of commandeered the event to show this Black Panther movie. So there was, it, there, it, was, it was a somewhat chaotic uh -huh. uh, ex experience. And in general, um, <clears throat> white critic, uh, white, you know, audiences stayed away. I think white audiences probably didn't go to see it. White critics either were extremely threatened by this film or else took another, you know, a, a sort of a more, um, uh, I don't know, sophisticated. Well, it's not for us. Yes, yeah. You know what I mean? It's not. Well, it's 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 not it's not it's not meant for us. And so yeah. you know, they 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 didn't want to judge it. Uh, the uh, uh, the black press was very interested in it, and some of it was 
because of the stars, clearly. I mean, yeah. it was just going to be interesting for that alone. But generally, was it got it got very good coverage, and you know, in, in Ebony and and the uh, uh, Amsterdam News and so on, and uh, uh, intellectuals, you know, the people who wrote for uh, uh, the Liberator, which you know was like the equivalent of partisan review or or a commentary or something like that. Uh, you know, they were critical of it because, you know, oh, Ruby D took a character who's not a positive, you know, they got involved in a positive image thing. But then you had uh, Nikki Giovanni, you know, the poet wrote a whole defense of this, of this movie. So there was a lot of conversation around it uh, among black audiences and, and none at all yeah. among, among white audiences. And so the movie was considered a fiasco and, and um, uh, Paramount re-released it you know, the following spring on a double bill with Skidoo, another, you know, mm -hmm. from their point of view, crazy movie from the, from the period, you know, I mean, Otto Preminger's LSD comedy. I mean, they just, well, just put them out together. You know I mean? Yeah. I can't imagine what the audience, what audiences made, you know, sitting through those movies back to back. It depends but, on what they were uh, taking at the time. Yeah. And, you know, and, and so everybody, you know, Dassin never wanted to make another movie in the United States or even probably even come back I mean, <laughs> after yeah. this. Yeah. yeah. And that raises an important question from, from the audience. Aaron Paley, uh, perhaps we can get that projected, writes, uh, this is a strong film for its time and a clear indication of the bridge between the Jewish and black communities. I'd love to hear from the panel about where black Jewish allyship stands now and how should that alliance be different uh, now that it's, uh, now that it was, uh, th th now than it was during Dassin's time. Can I say one thing before you answer the question? Okay, just to give, okay, yeah. I'm not sure I'm going to answer it. Okay. Uh, yeah, because <laughs> I actually wanted to um, agree with some things Jim said, that even though Giovanni wrote very positively about it, it didn't really help it help the film because some black critics also felt that the film just wasn't realistic, you mm -hmm. know, and that and and rejected it on the idea of its realism. I want to say that I think that, that the film, we haven't, we've been very praise praising of the film and haven't really talked about maybe some of the film's shortcomings or ex or its difference uh, in tone mm -hmm. from other American films. And I think that it's Europeanness or it's non-American sort of like elements are part of what made it harder for an American audience to consume. I mean, in some ways it, you know, the, the, because the central character tank is somebody that we has changed quite a bit from the informer, right? From the, the central character. And he's not somebody who we ever come to identify with or whose emotions we come to really emp have empathy for. There is no single character in this film that is our through line, the way mm -hmm. there's a Mookie and do the right thing. There is no Mookie here in this film. And so as a consequence, it's very much, sorry to go back to, to Eisenstein, it's, yeah. a, again, it's again like those Russian films in which the community is the character, right? And so you're supposed to identify with the collective struggle and you're figuring it out. If you, you know, is it is it the assimilationist or am I moving more towards black power, right? And so, but there is no single protagonist. And that I feel like is a tougher sell Absolutely. for American audiences. It's like not what, what uh, and I see this just as somebody who's like always working with undergraduates and teaching them, you know, talking <laughs> and, you know, with, with what they like, but it's, it's part of what they've been conditioned to like. And American audiences need that, you know, that classical Hollywood model of the character with whom yeah. you identify for an hour and a half. And it's this not film, relatable, as they no. say these days. Yeah. No. But you're right. The, the film enacts a dialectic. It, it's, it's meant to put you in between these exactly. two forces. Uh, and uh, exactly. uh, that is quite a challenge yeah. for an yeah. American audience. So yeah. it's it's didactic in, yeah. in uh, you know, it's... In I, some I ways. I don't want to call it Brexian, but, it's, but you're supposed to think, you know, about it as right. well as, you know, uh, uh, connect emotionally. Yeah, well, it's I, and 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 then at the, at the same time there are these weird moments uh, that are like carnivalesque, right? Like when he literally goes to the carnival and then like it goes into yeah. this other kind of like trippy world where everybody's face is weird and he's having this bizarre interaction with these upper middle class white people. So it's you know it's got all of these sort of like Euro European modernist art cinema touches in the middle of this didactic yeah. you know mm -hmm. dialectical film. <laughs> so it's quirky and I think we want to acknowledge that and kind of 
and talking about why it didn't succeed commercially. But I'm also buying time to answer that question. The, the audience. <laughs> question. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, maybe maybe Robbie can can uh, take that question into consideration. And sure, maybe. I mean, I uh, just quickly, I think that one of the interesting things that just to link it back to our earlier, the what I was saying earlier about people who were involved in the International Workers Order, uh, people like Jules Sasson, whose uh, involvement in politi the political struggle of the mid to late 1930s is is an interesting thing to consider because I think that when Dassin ends up leaving the United States, Jews and other groups uh, who are part of the International Workers Order First of all, Jews are understood his, as during that period as not white. And I think right. by the time he returns to make this film, Jews have become understood as white people. And so in a, in a sense, the, the relationship between a character like Teddy really does reflect mm -hmm. this uh, transformation of what it means mm -hmm. to be involved in the political struggle side by side with your, uh, with your comrades to then taking on this new role at like the question asked about allyship. How do we how do we best serve as allies now that we're no longer understood as being involved in the struggle in the same way? And, and I think this is challenging for audience, and I think it's specifically challenging for Jewish audience members and potentially for Dassin as well, to look at this film and say, well, where does where does this where does that figure of the Jewish radical now fit in mm -hmm. in this scheme of things? Um, and and has no footing in it uh, anymore. I think today, I think the question asks a little bit about. Jewish black allyship today. I mean, I think there's a lot of interesting movements that try to consider this from a historical context of understanding what whiteness means uh, to the Jewish community and to radical Jews um, and movements like Jews for Black Lives Matter and, and other groups of people who are who are organizing along these ideas of radical allyship are, are, are coming out now in this different way, in a way that actually speaks a little bit in the to the to that very scene where that scene about, well, educate your white brothers yes it's a really important moment i think for this question of where do jews now fit in in this new in the new organization of the psychotic illogic of of race in america where jews can transform into being from being non-white to white and where do they now fit in in this picture uh literally in this picture well uh, I think that's an excellent response, and we're we've just hit our hour mark. Um, and it looks like this film accomplished its its mission. We were in the dialectic and uh, managed to have an excellent conversation. Uh, I want to thank you all for for participating, and I want to thank the audience for watching us. Uh, 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 this will be available for for streaming uh, later as well. That's great. Thanks so much, Boris. Good. Thank Thanks you. Everyone. Thank you, everyone.